Okay, um, we have been talking about Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, pressure volume relationships, temperature volume relationships. So far, it's not that hard to digest. You can see what's going on here. It makes common sense when you think about it. Um, what we're going to do now is look at what resulted from the independent work of both of those guys because when, this is the way science works. When someone discovers something, usually someone else discovers something different, and someone else can take what both of them did and put them together into something unified. Uh, and that's, what, that's what we see here. Um, something called the combined gas law. It takes what Boyle's law shows. Remember pressure and volume. When pressure goes up, uh, oh, sorry, when volume goes down, pressure goes up, right, and vice versa. And Charles' law, which said basically that as temperature goes up, so does volume. Okay? We took both of those. Remember, it was P1V1 equals P2V2. That was Boyle's. Charles was V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Well, combine them all together. Write them together into something like that. You can see both equations at the same time, right? P1V1, P2V2, V1 over T1, V2 over T2. We'll put them all together, and notice that now we are able to look at three variables at once instead of two. So we can solve a little more complex problem. But the procedure is still all the same. You just identify what's in your problem and figure out you know, what variable is what, and then rearrange it algebraically. So the combined gas law is just that, Boyle's law and Charles' law combined. So let's take a look at an example here. Let's say that we have an initial set of conditions of the gas. There's our volume. Okay. Here's our pressure. And there's our temperature. Up until now, we've only dealt with two things, right? And we've kept some other things constant. Here we've got three different variables. Um, notice that we've got a compression here, so that means we've got a set of final conditions. There's our new volume, our new temperature. I want to know our final pressure. Well, all you've got to do is use that equation that we, just, that we just looked at. So write down what you know. Here's I've labeled the parts. See where that comes from, okay? There's our V1. There's our P1. This is what it changed to. Notice that this is in Celsius, right? And we're going to want to use Kelvin for all of our calculations. So there's always going to be that, that step of conversion there. So this is the equation we're going to want to use. Now we're going to want to solve for what variable? Again, remind me. P2. So we're going to have to rearrange our equation in order to solve for P2. So in that case, we would take our multiply both sides by T2, right? That would get rid of this and bring it up here. Then we would divide both sides by V2. Okay, so you can work all those steps out on your own. Um, here's what you get. Here's the equation we're using to rearrange it. We are going to, remember this is a reminder, make sure we go to Kelvin. Uh, there's our rearrangement right here. You would get P1V1 T2 over P1V2. Okay. Now all we've got to do is plug stuff in, now that we've labeled everything that we need. Here's our, our P1. Here's our uh, V1. Here's our T2 after we converted it down. It was 85 degrees. We had to convert it to Kelvin, so we put that here. We want to get rid of that degree Celsius because it's, it's going to be too much of a problem if we don't. Here's our T1 converted, and there's our new volume. Now, what I'm going to say now is that you should get used to in your head as you're working through these problems. Always think of volume in liters, so you might want to get used to converting things to liters. You don't have to yet, but you will, so you might as well go ahead and start doing it. Okay? You're going to want your volume in liters, temperature, in Kelvin, okay, and you'll actually, as you will see very shortly, you're much better off if you convert all of your pressures to ATM, okay, and I will show you why. There's a specific reason. Now, in this particular case, notice that it really won't matter, right, because that's what this millimeters of mercury, so that's, that's what it's going to be in, so that's right. Um, in this case, when we plug it in, we get P2 is equal to 1.25 times 10 to the third. Now, let's see if this makes sense, okay. Um, notice that we increased our temperature, right? So our pressure should naturally increase. Agreed? If we increase the temperature, our pressure should increase. Did it increase? Went from 735 to that. Yes, it definitely increased, so our answer makes sense. Also look at it in terms of volume. What happened to our volume? It decreased. So what should pressure do when volume decreases? It should increase. So all our, our answer is logically supported by by what we've learned so far. Okay. Now, Avogadro's law, another one of them. This is um, just the same thing over and over again. We just got a different variable now. 
This guy's got his thumb in everybody's pie, it seems like. We're going to hear about Avogadro a lot. He's still not done. Um, what was it that he's famous for? What, did he, what, what chemical term is, is very important associated with him? The mole, right? He came up with Avogadro's number, uh, which is the definition of a mole. Well, so this is going to be dealing with moles again. Uh, but in this case, what we're going to say is this. The volume is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules. That makes sense if you think about it. You ever wonder why a balloon blows up whenever you blow into it? You're putting more gas molecules into it, right? And the more gas molecules you put into it, what happens to the volume? It expands. Okay? That's all Avogadro's law says. Volume is dependent upon the number of things present, assuming that it's allowed to expand. Okay? Um, so that's Avogadro's law. We're going to use the symbol N, lowercase n, to represent the number of moles. Remember, moles are how we count things in chemistry. So that's, that's what we're going to use. The number of gas molecules is going to be the mole of gas molecules present. That's going to be represented with a little n. Okay, now I want you to understand this right here. It says equal volumes of gases contain equal numbers of molecules, and it doesn't matter what gas you have. And what I mean is it doesn't matter if I have if I have two liters of helium and two liters of carbon dioxide, those are very different molecules. Carbon dioxide weighs much more than helium, right? Um, it's bigger. It's got three atoms, and helium's only one atom big. Realize that it doesn't matter. If I have two liters of a gas, because of the properties of gas, because gas is spread out so much, and there's so much space between them, it is safe for us to assume that there are the same number of C. And if I have two liters at the same pressure, there's the same number, roughly, of carbon dioxide at molecules present as there are helium atoms present in that two liters. It doesn't matter what the gas is, if, if you have a certain volume, uh, it will always have the same amount of each type of gas present. Does that make sense? You see what I mean? Um, if I have two liters of helium, I would have X number of helium, atom, uh, X number of, of, of atoms present. If I had the same two liters in the same condition, but carbon dioxide instead, uh, in that there would be the same number of carbon dioxide molecules as I had of helium atoms. The numbers is going to be the same. The equal volumes contain equal number of molecules. It doesn't matter what the gas is. Now, that is different when we have liquids and solids because density becomes much more important. Uh, but for gases, they're so big and spread out, it doesn't really matter. All right, so here's what it, the expression says. As the number of moles increase, so does the, the volume, uh, according to what we have. So there's the equation for Avogadro's law. There you can see it. Stepwise increase the number of moles you have, you'll see that a stepwise increase in the volume associated with it. Okay, that's my baby picture. Not real. Uh, had some sweet hair though, didn't I? Check that out. I like that. Gee golly. Um, all right, here's a problem with Avogadro's law, or a, a sample. Okay, 4.8 liters uh, of helium gas contains 0.22 mole of helium. Now, I want you to think carefully about this problem. Okay. I'll, Use your noggin a minute. Notice what I'm asking. Read this. How many additional moles of helium must be added to obtain a volume of 6.4 liters? Here's what, I, here's what this problem is about. I have a container that is 4.8 liters in size. And it contains 0.22 mole of helium. That's how much helium is in it. I am trying to expand that. I want to create now, instead of occupying 4.8 liters, I want my gas to occupy 6.4 liters. I want to know, given the helium that's already in there, how much more helium do I have to blow into this container to make it expand to 6.4 liters? That's what this question is asking. <clears throat> Assume constant pressure and temperature. In other words, those are not going to be in your equation. Forget about T, forget about P. We're looking at V and we're looking at N. All right, what am I going to have to solve for? Think about Avogadro's equation. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. What am I going to be solving for in this, this problem? N2, is that going to be my final answer? What will be my final? How do I arrive at my actual final answer? That's right. I'm going to, I'm going to need a total number of moles present to make it 6.4 liters, right? But what the question asks is how much more do I have to add on top of what is there? So if I know, I calculate the total of what I need, then I just subtract from it what was already there to figure up how much I had to add into it. Okay, so the, the question's wording is a little bit different. All right, so good. We're going to solve for N2. Skip all this to get our equation. We've got to rearrange the equation to solve for N2. So here's what we'll end up with. 
it shows you the equation to use. Keep going, keep going. Bam, there we go. I've rearranged for N2 right here. Here's my expression. Now I plug in my numbers. Here's my volume, my, my final volume. Here is my um, initial number of moles. There's my initial volume. Notice liters cancel out. I'm left with moles. My final answer, 0.29 moles. My final answer for my what my final number of moles would be. Now, to find, like you said, to find how much I needed to add, I would take 0.29 minus 0.22, and I would have need to add it 0.07 moles to what I already had to expand that volume to 6.4 liters. Okay, questions about that? You know everything. Good. So it makes sense, right? And you can see the theory behind this. You had to add more moles of gas to make the volume bigger. That's the bottom line. Okay, um, now we get into something a little bit different. You got, uh, there's one more guy who we're not going to talk about. His name's Guy Lussac, but he had come up with another, a couple other ways to write equations. He basically said, hey, I see that uh, there's some P and N that you haven't messed with yet. There's a T and N that you haven't messed with yet. Let me write those in an equation form, and I'll put my name on it, and I get credit for it. Um, that's what he did, basically. Um, the, uh, and when that happened, now we have a whole bunch of these relationships, like P1V1 equals P2V2, V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Now there's a bunch of these, and we can start putting them all together. And when you start putting them all together, you can start coming up with, uh, this is beyond where we need to go, but come up with sort of constants and, and proportionality constants that, that predict when, when something increases, how much the other one will increase kind of thing. Um, and what basically all the work of these scientists allowed us to do was to create an equation that expresses, instead of having changing conditions, like here's my initial, now I changed it, here's my final, keep track of it kind of thing. Now we have the ability to look at one situation that does not change and know things about its pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles present. And if we know three of those things, we can find the fourth one, okay, based upon all this work. And that means that that is very different than what we've been doing because it's one unchanging condition that we know things about that we can infer the rest of it about. We, it's not something that changes from uh, an initial set of conditions to a final set of conditions. I'll show you what I mean. But this, come, this is, gave birth to what's called the ideal gas law. Okay? Um, the ideal gas law is this. Okay? PV equals NRT. You'll see it, it's sort of like, see how it's set up sort of like all the other equations we talked about? The P1, V1 equals P2, V2. P1, or sorry, uh, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N1. They just combined all the variables where they belong all together um, and found that every time you have a gas, the relationship of these variables in every single gas, when you divide that, they take that times that divided by that times that, it's the same for every single gas. There's a factor that remains constant all the time. It doesn't change. That's called the gas constant. Pretty clever word, huh? Um, the value is 0 0.0821. That is the ratio that never changes. So if you have a gas, and you know its pressure, you know its volume, you know its number of moles, and you know its temperature, if you plug those values in, no matter what your gas is, you're always going to get that answer. Okay? That is the ideal gas constant. You will need to memorize that, and it will be your friend. Okay? The... Um, you will have plenty of experience as you're working through these problems. You'll never forget it, um, but I, I might or might not have it on the test. I don't know yet, but it won't be an issue. You'll know it, what it is. Um, so what that means is if you know that when you know this about a gas, that that is always the same, let's re rewrite this to you know, make it a sim little bit simpler. That's the same equation. It's just written differently. PV equals nRT. Um, that tells us a ton about this gas that we have at hand. Um, P stands for pressure, obviously, V volume, N moles, T temperature, R is the gas constant that doesn't change. Notice the units. I told you to get used to ATM, liters, and Kelvin. This is why. Um, this number only works for these units. It will change if you change the units. Okay? Um, so I want everything now, from this point on, you'll have to convert to ATM, volume to liters, temperature to Kelvin. Then you can use this number. Okay? Um, now, this unit is non-existent, really. This number is just a ratio. See, it doesn't really have any units. It's just a factor expression. Um, these units are listed just so that things will cancel out when you do the math. You'll see what I mean. OK, <laughs> called the ideal gas law. And the, how you know when to use it? 
is when you're looking at your problem and you do not see changing conditions. Okay? If you're looking at your problem and you see, hey, there's a pressure. Hey, there's another pressure. It looks like that's P1 and that's P2. You're not going to be using that equation. This equation is only used when you have one state. There's, there, it's, it's, it's just P, but no P1 or P2. It's just P. When you only have one of each of those things, that's when you're going to use this equation. Okay? So take, for example, this. Calculate the number of moles of gas in a basketball inflated to a total pressure of 24.2 PSI with a volume of 3.2 liters at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, you can go home tonight and do this in front of your family if you really want to, okay, for fun. Take, take a basketball, take a soccer ball, take anything um, that is spherical especially, but it doesn't really matter. It can be cubical, and you can answer this question. Okay? Um, notice that I'm, it says calculate the number of moles. I'm solving for N, right? Here is P. What am I going to have to do with that P? What am I going to have to do with convert it to ATM? What will I need to know about PSI and ATM? What's equal to what? Right. There's my conversion factor, and I'll change it to ATM. My volume, is it okay that it's written in liters? Yep, that's the way I want it. What about degrees Celsius? I'm going to change it to Kelvin. So as long as you go home, if you grab a basketball, out of, yeah, out of your sports closet, take a temperature of the surroundings, convert it to Kelvin. You can convert it to Celsius, and you convert it to Kelvin. If you know what the volume is of the sphere that you're dealing with, this is some math pulled out now. Right? What's the volume of a sphere? I don't remember, four-thirds pi r cubed or something like that. I don't remember. Um, you can look up the formula to calculate the volume of a sphere. You'll know the volume then um, of, of the thing that you're dealing with. Um, then all you got to do is stick a pressure gauge on it and gauge the pressure of the air that's inside it. Then you can actually calculate how many gas molecules are inside this basketball. Pretty cool. Okay? Um, if you know the number of moles, then all you got to do is convert that right to like a number of molecules if you knew it was pure. In this case, like if it was pure nitrogen, then you would know it's nitrogen. In the case of air, obviously it's a mixture of a lot of things. So there's no way we know how many particular things are present, but you can get a number of moles of total air. Um, all right, so plug in what we know. Here's our expression. Remember, R is a constant. It's the same every time, so we'll put that number in. Skip, skip, skip. Um, we've got to convert our temperature, like you said, to, Kel to Kelvin. So there's 298. 25 degrees Celsius is about room temperature, so this is about room temperature in Kelvin, what you feel about right now. Um, there's our pressure conversion. Notice how I did that. We went from PSI to ATM using the proper conversion factor. We keep track of this. We don't round it off yet because we're still not done with our multiplication. We've got more math steps here. So we just keep track of where our sig figs would be. Now we plug everything in. We're solving for N, right? So N is going to be equal to this. Bring this down here on this side, PV over RT. So here's my P. Here's my V. Here's my R. Here's my T. Let's make sure all this stuff cancels out. See how... This K and this K cancels out, right, above and below. Um, this liter's on top. This liter's right here. That cancels out. The ATM cancels out. Now, notice that why you're left with moles. That's the only thing that's left. Um, remember, when you're doing math, if I give you this, like say, for example, I wanted you to take one, One divided by three fourths. How would you take one divided by three fourths? Multiply by four thirds, right? You'd have one times four over three. Well, let's look at this in the same way. Look at this unit and look at this guy down here. Okay? Um, if I have, well, I'll do all over the top. ATM, let's pretend those are numbers. ATM times liters divided by liters times ATM over moles times Kelvin, times Kelvin, right? These guys cancel out. That leaves me with this, ATM times liters, times what you did up here, right? I would ha now have moles multiplied by the reciprocal. Moles divided by liters times ATM. See how that cancels out now? That goes, that goes, that goes, that goes. I'm left with moles as my final unit, okay? So that means, my, obviously, this is all set up right. I'm going to get a mole value for my final unit. That's nice and neat. Yes, 
That's correct. Yep. Because this one has, all of these have, uh, well, that one has more, but three, three, and two. So, all right. So there you go. 0.22 moles is how many molecules of gas it would be in that particular basketball, for example. Now, if you knew that it was filled with something pure, um, you know, like it was inflated with nitrogen to make it a very bouncy, bouncy basketball, um, then you could then calculate the actual number of molecules of nitrogen present. Okay. Now, this is where it gets interesting because um, one of the, some of the common thread about what we've been talking about is we've learned some different ways to help identify things that we don't know what they are. We talked about density. That, that'll help. Uh, we talked about empirical formulas. Remember, um, if, we, if we knew the empirical formula of something and we know it's molar mass, we can get an idea of what the actual formula for that compound is. Well, this is going to contribute to that as well. Um, in the gaseous state, we can figure out the molar mass of something by using the ideal gas law. Because if you know how much something weighs, and then you can figure up how many moles are present in that substance after you weigh it, then you know how many grams are present for every mole, grams per mole, right? Grams per mole is a unit for molar mass. And that can be used and looked on the periodic table. We can start figuring out what stuff is once we know the molar mass of that thing. You could couple that with um, the empirical formula and then figure out the actual molecular formula. All right, so one way to do it is um, realize that, okay, say you have an unknown, unknown sample of something. Okay, it's like so, some kind of powder and you're trying to figure out what it is. One thing that you can do is vaporize it. You can weigh it. Know how much of it you have exactly. You could vaporize it, okay? And then when you vaporize it, measure the conditions of that gas that has just been created. Note the pressure, note the temperature, note the volume, okay? Um, and if you can do those things, guess what you can figure out? PV equals NRT. You know P, V, and T. R is a constant. What can you solve for? N number of moles, right? So when you vaporize something, turn it into a gas, keep track of all uh, the other three variables, pressure, temperature, and volume, you can then use math to come up with a mole value that has to be true. Um, you take your original mass that you had, take that divided by the moles that you counted, then you've got grams per mole. You've got the molar mass of that, of that object. Um, now, when you're dealing with gases themselves, realize that the volume, for example, is very hard to collect. I'm gonna, our next lab is going to be about this. You're going to collect oxygen gas, um, and you'll see that you have to get kind of tricky with it whenever you do this. Um, the, uh, whenever a gas has evolved from a reaction, as you have learned in here from some of the like, gas evolution reactions that we've done, it kind of just escapes into the atmosphere, and it's hard to contain that. It's hard to measure it. Um, mostly because you have to have a rigid container because we know that gases will expand in their container and everything like that. So um, we have to rely on a little bit of math here. Um, but here's what we can do as well. If you take a look at this problem, let's say that I have, instead of doing like what I said a minute ago, taking a solid and vaporizing it, let's just say that I give you like a balloon or something filled with pure gas, and you weigh it. You can, um, let's say you knew the, how much the balloon weighed, before you started, so you could tear that out, right? And you could figure out just how much the gas itself weighed. Let's say in this case, you knew that the sample of gas that you had came from a mass or, or itself weighed 0.311 grams, okay? Now, <clears throat> what you allowed to happen, um, its volume is, as it is occupying, here's the conditions under which it is occupying. It currently has a volume of 225 milliliters, or 0.225 liters. Okay? It has a temperature of 55 degrees Celsius, after your experiment's over, and a pressure of, looks like a little bit above atmospheric pressure. Right? It's 886 millimeters of mercury. You know, because you have a barometer, you can stick it in, the, in, your, in your experiment. You have a thermometer, you can measure the temperature. So a barometer and thermometer, these are easy measurements to take. Right? Um, the volume is much more difficult to take, but in this case, you have a closed system that, that you, can, you can monitor the volume. So we know the volume here. I want to know what this gas, you know, part of what is, what is this gas? What is it? Um, 
And the first step that I did to, to doing that is finding its molar mass. Okay, I want to know what its molar mass is. So to know its molar mass, I got to know two things. I got to know the number of moles, and I got to know the mass. One of which I already have, the mass. Now I have to calculate the number of moles. So I write down what I know. Okay, I've labeled it. Notice I got to convert to Kelvin. I'm probably going to have to do watt to this pressure. ATM, change it to ATM. Okay. All right. So here's what, these are the two things I'm going to be using: the definition of molar mass and my PV equals nRT equation. So here we go. I am solving for, this shows me how I get to N. I'm going to rearrange this equation to solve for N. N, N is going to equal PV over RT. Once I have N and I know the mass, that's how I'm going to get the molar mass. Okay. So here we go. Here's my temperature conversion. I take my 55 and convert it to Kelvin. Now I've got to do my pressure conversion. I've taken my 886 and converted it to ATM. Um, looks like that unit's wrong. Sorry. That's supposed to be... ATM, not millimeters of mercury, right? Okay, so I've got what I need there. Now I'm going to plug it in. Here's my pressure. Here's my volume. Here's R. It's always the same. Here's my temperature. I cancel out my units. I should be left with moles. There's the number of moles that are present in the gas under the conditions that I currently have. Now all I have to do is take the mass that I had to start with, divide it by the number of moles that I just calculated, there's my molar mass of that gas. Okay. Um, so if I can run it through a machine now and get an idea, remember like percent carbon, percent hydrogen, that kind of thing like we did before, I can start figuring out the empirical formula. Once I figure out percentage composition in an empirical formula, I take my base empirical formula, compare it to my molar mass, I've identified my product. Okay. Pretty cool stuff. That's PSI. That's how many PSI are in one ATM. Yep. That's another way to measure pressure. OK. Now, look at all this. That's all that means. Memorize that. Fill it all in on the table on the test. You laughed. You thought I was kidding? No. Um, <laughs> the. the uh, you take a look at this, we've been dealing with a lot of equations, right? A lot of P's and V's and T's and a lot, a lot, a lot, yada. I'm not giving those to you, no. Um, so that's why you need to listen to what I'm getting ready to say. I'm going to show you how to figure them all out, okay, in any given instant to know what you need. It's actually very simple to do. It's not really math, it's sort of pseudo math, but you'll see what I mean. You need to memorize one equation, just one, okay? You need to memorize. This one, PV equals NRT. If you can remember that one, you're in good shape because here's why. Let's say you're looking at your problem. And as you read it, you're labeling your, your variables like you're supposed to. You say, okay, this is V1, this is P1. And after you look at your problem, you see that you have multiple volumes. So you have a V1 and a V2. And you have changing pressure as well, let's say. In this case, that's what we would have, volume and pressure. Those are the two things you notice are changing. You see no mention of moles. You see no mention of temperature because they're held constant. So you, you forget about them. You don't incorporate them into your math. You ignore those, the N and the T, in this equation. That's why they're in red. As written, PV equals NRT. Ignore the N and ignore the T because they're not part of what you're trying to solve for. You will not be using this entire equation because you have changing conditions. Remember that. Don't forget that. The only time you will use PV equals NRT as a whole equation is if you have unchanging conditions. If you have any changing conditions, you've got to do all these multiple variable stuff out here, like the P1, V1, P2, V2 thing. OK, remember PV equals NRT. Write that down. Eliminate from that equation what is being held constant, what is not involved with your calculations, in this case, N and T. Now, Obviously, you're going to mark out R because the only time you're ever going to use R is if you're going to use that whole equation. Okay? So you mark out R in all of these. You mark out, in this case, N and T. Now look at your equation, what's left. I have PV on the left. Virtually, I have nothing now on the right, right. Now, what I want to now do is duplicate 
both, side, make the, both sides of the equation match in terms of the letters that are there. So if I have PV on this side, I'm going to write it exactly the same, PV on the other side. That's going to be P1V1 equals P2V2. Okay, you see how I did that. I'll do it again for this one. Let's say you're reading your problem, and you've identified volume and temperature as the entities that are changing in your, in your problem. You see no mention of moles, no mention of pressure. They're irrelevant to your problem. Well, they're relevant, but they're, they're being held constant. So I take my PV equals NRT, and I negate pressure. I negate the number of moles. They're not, they're not part of what I'm dealing with here. And obviously, I've got to negate R as well, because if I start and mark stuff out, then I'm always going to mark out R every time I mark out anything. Okay, that leaves V over here and T over here. Now what I want to do is move everything that I have left to the left side. How do I move, if V is T and V is here, T is here, how do I move T from the right side to the left side? I divide both sides by T, right? So I would do that. I would bring V over T. So now look what I've created. I make the other side match. Now I've got V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, okay? And this one, notice this guy. Um, told you he wrote a couple things that were left and then filled in the gaps. But let's say pressure and temperature is what I'm dealing with. I make no mention of moles or volume, so I leave those out. Ignore volume, ignore moles. Thus, always ignore then the gas constant. I'm left with P and T. Now I've got to put it all on one side. Bring that T over this side. Divide both sides by T. I've got P over T. What do I put here? The exact same thing, okay, except the final form, P2 over T2. You can figure out then all the equations from that. You can also figure out the uh, combined gas law, right? If you need P, V, um, uh, and T, right? P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. You can also figure that out because um, that means you would have P. I don't have it up here, but you would have P, you would have V, but instead of T being red, you would keep it, right? It would still be something you want. The only thing you would mark out would be N and R. So then you have to pull that T over to the left side, and you would have PV over T. Then just make, all, make them all ones, and then make the other side of the equation match with twos, P1 or P2, V2 over T2, right? Does that make sense? Read this again. This is an explanation of it, okay? Um, that way you don't have a bunch of equations to memorize. Look at how easy it is to figure out all the ones that you need. You're just memorizing that one. This right here, only use this if you have unchanging conditions. PV equals NRT is only for unchanging conditions. You'll see that it won't work any other way because you'll try to find a P2. and you know, if, you, if you have a P2 and you try to use PV equals NRT, you can't because there's only one P there in that equation. Okay, um, just to mention here, ideal versus real gases, we've been talking about I mentioned the kinetic molecular theory and sort of all the theory behind why these equations work. Um, but realize, in reality, real gases don't necessarily behave like we are assuming that they behave. Um, there are ideal gases represent an ideal, a perfect situation where they're constantly bouncing off each other like ping pong balls. They're not attracted to each other. They're just kind of there. Um, no attractions between gas molecules. Um, we're assuming that gas molecules do not take up a lot of space. Um, Everything then is based on the kinetic molecular theory. Um, just to point out, though, so that you know, depending on the gas, you know, if I have two like molecules together, they can still interact with one another. And they can still be attracted to each other. It depends on the chemical properties of that gas. But also realize that at very low temperatures, what is happening is these gases, as they slow down, they become closer together. They get really close together. And that increases the frequency of them bumping into each other and facilitating, like, some sort of interaction between them. You get them too close together, and they're not spread out like they want to be. So at very low temperatures, when you, when you move them down to where they're next to each other, um, some of this behavior is, becomes more unpredictable that we've been talking about. Likewise, at high pressures, you cannot make those same assumptions. At high pressure, it's sort of like you've got this container, and you're pushing down with it. You're cramming those molecules together. You're making them, forcing them to get close to each other like you would in a low temperature situation. Again, your four, sometimes interactions would happen that normally would not in that case. That, this theory also breaks down under those circumstances. And that's what this is. Those blue lines represent intermolecular interactions, gas particles that sort of weakly get attracted to each other. That's going to screw up these results a little bit if, that, if that's true. Okay. Um, 
interesting here about uh, when we mix gases together, I told you it's sort of a homogeneous mixture. And, and remember, too, that um, the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. Okay? Um, so, for example, right now, say we're about 20% oxygen, 21% oxygen in our environment. We feel about 1 atm, right, of total pressure down upon us. Realize that only one-fifth of that total pressure, only 20% of that total pressure, is from the oxygen atoms that are present. Seven, almost 78% of that total pressure that you feel um, is actually due to the nitrogens by themselves. So if we actually removed all of the oxygen from our environment and it was gone, it would drop our atmospheric pressure from 1 to about, uh, what, 80, 79, right? Somewhere in there, like 7, 0.079, no, 0.79, sorry, ATM. Um, so what I'm saying is you can look at air, for example, as two different ways. You can look at it as one big entity that has its own pressure. But you can also look at it as what's inside it. What are the separate things inside the air that are contributing to that pressure? Um, each one sort of has its own. And that's what this is about. Um, this is where partial pressure comes in. Partial pressure is the pressure exhibited by each individual gas inside of a mixture. So, for example, the total pressure, this is called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. The total pressure is equal to the pressure of each part, each gas that's present. So if I want to get the total pressure of the atmosphere, I've got to add the pressure of oxygen that's present, plus whatever pressure is exhibited by nitrogen, plus whatever CO2 is, plus argon, plus all the other trace stuff. And when you add it up together, you get 1 atm. Okay? That's all that's saying. So there's an example. You're missing 0 .001 of it because not everything was added up. These are just the three biggest parts. Okay? Um, Nitrogen, oxygen, argon. We didn't even add in carbon dioxide or all the other trace things that are present. But you can see how that number gets there. Okay, so realize that if something is 21% oxygen, that means whatever pressure is that you are reading, you take 21% of that pressure, right, to find out the pressure for oxygen alone. That's, that's all this is really saying. It's pretty straightforward. So, for example, if I have a gas mixture that's 80% helium, and 20% neon, but I know the total mixture has a pressure of 1 atm, what would the partial pressure of helium be? Well, you just take 80% of 1 atm, right, which is what? 0 0.80. So it would be 0 0.80 atm for the partial pressure of, of helium. Okay. Partial pressures become very important um, in uh, like I know some of you guys said you weren't in there, but if anyone ta is in a respiratory program, um, you know, you'll spend a ton of time dealing with partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood and diffusion stuff in there and how all that works. But, um, I mentioned this before um, about how pressure decreases the higher we go up, but there's some interesting facts here. Um, our body is adapted. Physiologically, right now, we are in tune to breathe a partial pressure of oxygen of about 0.21 atm. Now, what that means is we are adapted to breathe air that is 21% oxygen at the current pressure that we are, we are breathing. Um, so it's not just about, what's important to note here is not just about the total atmospheric pressure. That's part of it because our gas that we need so much, that oxygen, is within that total pressure. So we have to move our body so that the total, whatever's in the environment, moves in, right, to get inside of us. But at the same time, what else is important is not just that pressure but also the actual partial pressure of oxygen. It doesn't matter if we can breathe in if there's not enough oxygen in the air that we're breathing in. Right? We have to have a certain amount present. 0.21 atm of that total pressure must be due to oxygen alone, or somewhere in there. We can deviate a little bit. But what you'll find, for example, is like people that live in the Himalayan mountains, way up high, um, are actually adapted to a much lower pressure of, of, of partial pressure of oxygen. They can live. Uh, their body is, has physiologically adapted over many, many generations to be able to live with a much lower partial pressure of oxygen. They can. Uh, other animals, too, it's not up here. I think I mentioned this before, right, with like alpacas and some other things that live up higher in the mountains. Um, they have the ability to just create more viscous blood, have more red blood cells at any given time, a concentration higher than ours. So as to, since there's less oxygen available, they can carry more of what is there, and they get more efficient use out of the oxygen that's traveling around in their body. Um, but anyways, partial pressures of oxygen lower than 0.1 atm. Okay, so... You, you have a, a range here, you can see. You can range anywhere from, you like 0.21. Um, generally, maximum it, that you can handle is about 1.6. 
Um, he, that's obviously even above atmospheric pressure, right? Um, there's your tolerable range of oxygen partial pressures that we can actually exist with. Notice that if it drops below 0.1, though, we've got a condition it's hypoxia. We know that hypo in, in the sciences means too little or not enough of, right? You've got too little oxygen present, hypoxia, and that's detrimental. Um, that could cause unconsciousness. It starves your brain very quickly. Um, it could lead to tissue death if the oxygen is not being delivered to your tissues. Um, bodily death as well, worst case. So over Christmas break, if you plan on climbing Mount Everest, keep this in mind. Um, you're going to have to take some oxygen with you. And the reason is not because of how tough you are, but because of physiological limitations. On top of Mount Everest, the pressure of the air is about one-third of what you feel right now. That's the total pressure, 0.311 atm. So if you figure that oxygen is about 20% of the air, you'll find that the partial pressure of oxygen by itself of that total air is 0 0.065 atm. That is far below even hypoxic conditions, right? You will die if you try to breathe on top of Mount Everest. You will have to take oxygen with you at a higher pressure so that you can deliver it to your lungs when you're trying to breathe. Interesting. To bring back a little bit of what we've already talked about, um, diving in partial pressures, I mentioned oxygen toxicity. You can have too much oxygen uh, in your body, um, and it, it is toxic if that is the case. We're, not, we're only designed to carry a specific amount. You've probably learned by now, being in the healthcare industry, um, you know, it's all about balance. Too much or too little of anything is, is bad for you, right? There's a happy medium. Same it is with oxygen. Generally, if you get oxygen above 1.4 atm, and that's your partial pressure, you're going to see effects of that. That's going to be oxygen toxicity. Muscle spasms, tunnel vision, convulsions, real pleasant experience. Um, now, I mentioned before nitrogen as well. Uh, I mentioned nitrogen narcosis, um, rapture of the deep. Uh, what can happen is if you have uh, too much pressure of oxygen, sorry, too much pressure of nitrogen that you are intaking and forcing into your, uh, into your bloodstream under abnormal circumstances. Normally it wouldn't go there like we are now, but if you can force it in there, um, that you get gaseous nitrogen, like I said before, sort of in your bloodstream. And when you rise and you come back out of the water, that pressure changes and that nitrogen is no longer soluble in your blood anymore and it sort of bubbles out and it returns to its undissolved gaseous form. Well, what that can create are a, a bunch of tiny little blood clot bubbles that, that act like blood clots that can go around and plug up a hole somewhere and prevent blood flow. And if that happens, tissues are starved of oxygen, right, and tissues can die. That's why it's called... Nitrogen narcosis, narcosis means tissue death, right? Um, it could lead to a, str a stroke if it restricts blood supply to the brain. Uh, a lot of bad things could happen. So, um, <clears throat> Now, keep this in mind as well. The, uh, we went through already how whenever it keep, you keep going down, you have to increase the pressure of the air that you are breathing, right, to make up for the pressure of the water coming in all around you on all sides. Take this. Uh, into consideration. At a depth of 55 meters, so you're looking at, let's say it was 50 meters, that's like what, 150 feet? So it's more than 150 feet. That's way down there. I want you to imagine for a second. We probably all swam, right, and got into a deep end of a pool. Let's say it's 10, 12 feet deep, even if it's only 9 feet deep. You swim down to the bottom, you feel that pressure on your head. Now, that's only like 10 feet. Imagine going 15 times deeper than that, and the pressure then will be exerted on your body. Okay? Now, there are people who do this professionally. Um, that's a tremendous amount of pressure for the human body to withstand. Well, we're not designed to do that. Muscles, joints, um, bodily functions, all that is going to be suppressed and affected uh, at, that deep, at that deep of a, uh, of a dive. But at a depth of 55 meters, the partial pressure of oxygen um, would normally be 1.4 AT, uh, atm. Now, we are approaching oxygen toxicity, right? to the point where if we are breathing like normal in a regular mixture of, of air that um, is, is typically 20% oxygen or whatever, if we take that normal sample of air, put it in our tanks, pressurize it, whatever, dive down below 150 feet or so, um, your regulator is going to want to deliver oxygen to you at 1.4 atm, right? It has to. That's what it's trained to do so that you can get this oxygen in. But the problem is the partial pressure of oxygen becomes too high now, and you're delivering more oxygen because of that high pressure 
more oxygen than what your body needs. Actually, more oxygen than is safe. It can create oxygen toxicity. So the answer to this has to be a different mixture of gas. You have to create now. You can't breathe normal air. You have to create a new air mixture that has a lower partial pressure of oxygen, to where it's mostly helium, for example. Um, divers that go below 50 meters uh, use a mixture of helium and oxygen called heliox that contains a lower percentage of oxygen than normal air does. So that when you get down there and the total ATM pressure that's pumping in is, is, is a lot higher, it's going to be actual less percentage-wise of oxygen, so it's not going to be toxic to your body. You're sucking in a lot of helium, but you don't talk to each other when you're 150 feet down, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, you don't have to sound funny. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into this, right? I don't know. That's interesting, though. That's an experiment. I'll try that in the pool. Suck in helium, jump down, and give it. You know, you, you talk and you can hear it all around you when you're in the pool. I wonder what it like sounds like to talk with helium. I'll try it. Um, the uh, <clears throat> there's a lot that goes into some of this stuff. It's not just strapping on fins and jumping down in the ocean. I mean, it, you could die if you don't do this right. So, a lot of training that goes into this. We talked about this already. When you pump stuff in, like here at 30 meters, you've got a total pressure of 4 atm. You're that's compact. You're pressing in a lot of gas when you inhale all of that. Notice that the lungs are really dense and filled, more than normal, right? Here's atmospheric at the surface. Notice what's going to happen if this person just takes up to the top. These lungs, because of that high pressure, when that drops, that volume is going to expand. Uh, and in so doing, could create a lot of damage. All right. <clears throat> I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, I'll mention this just because um, we are uh, going to be doing this in the lab. Our, our lab, just so you know, that, that's coming up, is you are going to calculate the R constant. It's what you're going to show me how you got it. Um, you're going to have the pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles of a certain gas, um, and you're going to prove to me that 0 0.0821 is the real number. And I just didn't make this up. Um, it's a little bit of an elaborate setup. You're going to have to take uh, a compound. You're going to run a decomposition reaction of potassium chlorate. It's a very volatile reaction. You have to be careful. A lot of pressure builds very quickly. You heat it up, and it decomposes into oxygen as, as the gas that's evolved. You'll have some tubes. You'll collect that oxygen. You'll have to displace some water to take your volume measurements. Um, and you're going to have a ratio of all that stuff, and you're going to come up with R from all of that. Uh, but I mention that because... When we collect gases like that, generally gases are, have to be collected, especially if you're going to measure like a volume. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is when you spit out oxygen from a reaction, it's really hard to measure its volume, right? So what we do is we make it so that we have some water in a container, and we seal it all up, and we pressurize this container so that now when we open this clamp over here, when the oxygen is coming through, Whatever oxygen is produced pushes out the water that was in the container, and it pushes it up through the straw, and it pushes it out the side. And however much volume of water gets spit out is equal to the amount of, um, of, of gas volume that was put in, like Archimedes' principle, except we're dealing with gases here instead of pennies and water. Right? It's the same concept, um, but we have to collect that gas over water is what we're doing. And, that, and then it's pushing down on the water and displacing the water. Well. That's you, generally the way that we collect gas is, is, is by, that very re, by that very mechanism. Now, here's the problem with that. As we are measuring pressure, what you have to realize is that when you have a closed system, as that oxygen is coming in, it's building pressure, right? But the water, assuming that it's pure water, some of the water molecules are going to have left the surface of that water and are going to be H2O gaseous molecules that are floating around. There's no way to prevent that. Things evaporate because things turn at the surface turn into a gaseous state. So some of that pressure, all of it's not going to be due to oxygen. Some of it's going to be due to water vapor, a very small amount. Okay? What we have to do is subtract that out so that we know what pressure is due to just oxygen alone. Okay? We want to account for any water vapor that's present and subtract that out so we can just get the oxygen. And that's what this is about. The partial pressure of the water vapor called the vapor pressure depends only on the temperature, uh, what this is saying. Okay? Um, so w what this means to you, all that you need to be able to do is read a table that I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a table that has specific temperatures listed 
And it has measured over a period of time, people have, have come up with this data, what the vapor pressure of water is at various temperatures. So if you know the temperature of the reaction that you're performing, all you got to do is look on the table and say, okay, at this temperature, here's how much pressure would be present because of water. Then you would subtract that out from the total barometric pressure that I gave you. Okay. Um, so for example, if you collect a gas sample with a total pressure of 758 millimeters of mercury at 25 degrees, the partial pressure of water vapor will be 23.8 because you'll see over here, um, there's a table that's in more detail that I'll give you in the lab on the test, that kind of thing. Um, notice that at 25 degrees Celsius, there's the pressure that's attributed to just water vapor by itself. The amount of, of water molecules that have turned to gaseous form is hovering right above the surface of the liquid that's exerting a downward force now because of their presence. That's what this is. Um, so in that case, at 25 degrees, water alone comprises that much pressure. So what you'll want to do, if this is the pressure of your whole system, subtract that away from this. And in so doing, you get 734 for your actual pressure of the gas that you want, not just the water. Okay? That's what this is. So this is, uh, for example, uh, one way to collect it. Say you had zinc and you dropped it in hydrochloric acid. This is going to be a single displacement reaction, right? You're going to form zinc chloride, and hydrogen is going to separate, form bubbles. So you can collect those bubbles. If you have this inverted okay, in, in a solution like this with water, you'll see that that can go right in here, assuming this was sealed up, and those hydrogen molecules would travel in here and then displace the water. If this was filled up with water, it would start pushing that water out, right? All this top part is where the gas would start to collect, and the more that was produced, the more this water level would drop inside of here because of the gas that's being accumulated. So that's why you see hydrogens up here, but you also see water molecules up here because, because of the bubbling action, because of the fact they're at the surface, you're going to knock some water molecules loose into gaseous form just because they're there. Not a lot, but some. So we have to subtract those because what we care about is just the pressure of the hydrogen not the water vapor. Okay. We'll stop there, actually. So we'll stop a little bit early.